So over the next few months, we're trying to develop our drugs policy uh, a little. We've basically got a conservative drugs policy in that we want to maintain uh, criminal sanctions against you know, currently illegal drugs in order to deter uh, people from experimenting with them, in order to reduce the supply, in order, as a consequence, to reduce the harm done by drugs. Now, as part of my research for this, I've read this book, Drugs Without the Hot Air, by David Nutt. He's someone of the other view. His view is basically there's not really much point in trying to stop people taking drugs. They're going to do it in any case. So all the government can try and do is to pick up the pieces and reduce the amount of harm that's done by illegal, well, uh, recreational uh, drug use. So I was intrigued to hear his case for that and to just learn more, more about the issue uh, in general, which I certainly did. So I'm going to go through the book, look at a few quotations, just respond to them. I'm not going to offer like a structured analysis of the of the whole book, but I'm sure you'll find some of the little snippets of information in here are absolutely fascinating. I'll learn some things that I've got no idea uh, about at all. So let's uh, jump into it and see what he's got to say and hear what I've got to say as well. I said it's going to be quite a long video, so uh, are you sitting comfortably or, uh, you know, on your long run or walk or something? Have a listen. So anyway, hopefully you'll find this interesting. So basically it talks about uh, the fact that governments generally focus on policies intended to reduce the number of drug users and is saying that doesn't really work. What you really need to do is focus on reducing the total amount of harm done by drugs. He says, for a start, um, it's not clear that governments are especially influential on whether or not someone tries a drug because their ex experimentation is largely determined by social norms and cultural trends. Whereas government policies can be very influential on whether or not an individual is harmed by a drug. Now, just as an initial thing there, I would tend to disagree. I think the government can have significant uh, influence on the ethos and culture within a nation with regard to drugs, through education, through the law, through cultural leadership. But he thinks that that's fairly ineffective. And all you can do is basically try and help people who are already taking drugs. Now, quite early in the book, he lays out the harms that can result from drugs. I quite like this bit. I quite like the sort of structure to his thinking here. So I'll just go through it, see what you think of these. Right, so drugs can cause harm to drug users. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? So what sort of harms? He talks about drug-specific mortality, and that's where basically the drug kills you. Uh, pretty straightforward, right, with an overdose, usually. And he talks about the safety ratio for a drug, which is the ratio between the amount of drug you need to take for a psychoactive effect and the amount that would kill you. So if the ratio between those amounts is quite small, that means when you take the amounts to get the positive effect, you're quite close to the amount that would kill you. That would be a very dangerous drug. Whereas a safer drug would be one where the amount you take for the effect would be far, far short of the amount that would kill you. He gives an example. He said, alcohol safety ratio is 10. If two units of alcohol are enough to have a psychoactive effect on a small female, 20 units will put her into a lethal coma. Uh, okay, you can see the logic there, but... This is a pretty woolly calculation, isn't it? Two units for, for psychoactive effect, maybe not for the psychoactive effect that the person is looking for. So I think the calculation is a bit vague, but I can see what he's getting at. That is an interesting measure of the danger of drugs. It says there's also drug-related mortality, where, for example, uh, cancer, which is not directly caused by the drug, but the drug is known to increase the incidence of those illnesses. It also, this could be accidents as well. So if you drink alcohol and then get, get run over by a car as you're staggering across the street, did the alcohol kill you? Well, no, but it was a drug-related mortality. So I so said that's uh, okay. good point. Drug-specific harm. This is harm caused by the drug, but doesn't actually uh, kill you. So this might be like cirrhosis of the liver, um, you know, breathing problems for tobacco smokers, cocaine nose, that sort of thing. So that's drug-specific harm. Drug-related harm is damage short of death, but drug-related. So again, it could be accidents, infections, susceptibility to other illnesses, that sort of thing. Another danger for users is dependence, uh, which is the word he likes to use for addiction. 
a drug specific impairment of mental functioning. So that means you take the drug and while you're under the influence of, of the drug, your brain doesn't work properly. Therefore, there's a likelihood that you, you do crazy things, you do dangerous things, you do violent things. But there's also drug related impairment of mental functioning. Now this is not while you're under the influence of the drug, this is afterwards. So for example, it might make someone depressed or demotivated or whatever. So that there are longer term effects that are not directly caused by the drug in the body at that time, but it's the damage that was done by the drug that's longer lasting. Now, loss of tangibles, losing your job, income, possessions, home. Uh, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Loss of relationships, uh, friends, uh, business colleagues, but more particularly family. Uh, the damage to family relationships is uh, particularly important because they're so crucial to a person's life. But he also talks about harms to other people, which I was very pleased to see because my criticism often of people who are assessing the issue of drugs is they only talk about the harms and risks to drug users. They tend to ignore or very much downplay uh, the negative effects on other people and wider society. But he lists several things here. So he talks about injury. So injury to other people by accidents or violence or you know, you set your house on fire or set your block of flats on fire uh, while under the influence of alcohol, drugs, whatever. Uh, crime, drug related crime is a huge issue, partly because of the impaired judgment and impulsivity and partly because of uh, the need to, uh, to feed the habit. Economic cost, uh, people not turning up for work, people needing uh, health care, rehabilitation treatment, the policing costs uh, are huge. So that's an impact on society impact on family life, obviously hugely negative impact on the lives of uh, spouses, children in particular, a lot of child abuse and neglect cases involve drug or alcohol uh, abuse. Uh, international damage. This is the idea that uh, a drugs market in one country, uh, that has a result in another country because there's the you know gang warfare, uh, various issues related to the illegal drug production in other countries. Talks about environmental damage. I'm not, don't see that as a particular issue. Okay, you know, growing anything can have environmental consequences, whether you're growing cabbages or cannabis, that there's potential uh, issues there. But I don't see that as particularly relevant in this context. Uh, decline in reputation of the community. Very good one. Uh, that's really good. I mean, if, who wants to live in an area surrounded by drug addicts? I mean, unless it's your mission to. Uh, you know, your vocation is to help and support drug addicts and to get involved in their lives, then you might want to move there. If you want to bring up a family or just get on with other aspects of your life, it's probably not the area you want to uh, move into. So yeah, that was a lot of good points. I would maybe add some. I think um, one of the harms to others as well is, uh, by drugs, by using drugs, is to set an example as well. If one person, so you know, I, I uh, use cannabis, that's fine, that's what I do, it doesn't do me any harm, then that has a negative effect on other people by tending to lead them down the same road that uh, might lead to problems in the future. And they also, basically, you impact culture by your example as well. So that's a, a harm to other people of an individual's drug use. Now, it's very hard to pin down which element of harm was caused by which particular person's drug use, but in general, the effect on culture of drug users is to make drug use seem more acceptable and prevalent and therefore tempting to people. Now, having said that, I really like the way you laid out those harms and I was quite encouraged on page 42. For the other, whatever, 300 pages of the book, he says virtually nothing about the harms to others and it's virtually all about the harms to the user. In other words, it falls into exactly the trap that I feel most people do when they talk about drugs, and that's to focus on the harm to the drug user rather than the wider harm. The harm to the drug user is very unfortunate, um, but there is in a sense that they're responsible for it, in almost all cases, to some degree, are responsible for it. But a lot of the other people that experience the harms, they are innocent, entirely innocent uh, of it. Right, okay, he's talking about drug legalization here. Just talking about a little snippet I found quite interesting. He said, in poorer countries, ketamine provides the only anesthetic that does not require a patient to be ventilated. 
In Zambia, about half of all operations are carried out under it. So ketamine, uh, used in Zambia to perform operations. In other places, it's a recreational, illegal recreational drug. So it said, in particular in China, there's been a problem with ketamine being used as an illegal recreational drug. So there have been international attempts led by China to get the UN to ban ketamine completely worldwide. As seen by the therapeutic uses above, such a ban would be a disaster for poor countries bringing huge harms. Drug science and other expert organisations have strongly argued against this proposed ban, and so far the World Health Organisation has not supported the Chinese request. However, the fact that China is trying to deal with a local ketamine abuse problem by pushing for an international worldwide ban shows how far we still have to go in developing rational international drugs control policies. Uh, yep, fair enough. That also brings it home to me, just the way that these, like the World Health Organization, the way it operates, it's not a matter that it's a fount of universal wisdom to apply to all countries in the world. It's an organization pushed around by vested interests uh, instead, which is the case there. We'll come to another case uh, later on. Right, we're on to alcohol now. He's talking about alcohol. It makes a good point. He said, challenging the culture of extreme intoxication is one of the most difficult tasks we face, but is essential if harm is going to be reduced. I agree entirely. In Scotland, maybe not so much recently, but a few years ago, it was quite common to hear politicians say, we need to change our attitude to alcohol. Atti uh, Scotland needs a new attitude to alcohol. But they would never say what really needed saying, and that is that drunkenness is inherently irresponsible. But that's the heart of the problem. If you choose to enter into a state where you're not really responsible for your actions and you're likely to act irresponsibly and dangerously, then that is a moral decision and it's not an acceptable one because the risks you impose on other people are without their consent. So uh, that's, that's a moral issue. The Scottish Family Party, we've got that was, was one of our policies to try to promote the idea that drunkenness is, is a moral issue and it's inherently irresponsible. So... Um, you, you can say all the other parties are populist, basically. They, they won't say the things that need saying that might be unpopular with many people, but we're not populist. We are aiming for the well-being, maximise the well-being of uh, people in Scotland, so we are willing to say that. I mean, drunkenness is inherently irresponsible, so we want to look at steps to uh, reduce its social acceptability, not make it illegal, but to reduce its social acceptability. Now, this next thing was interesting. It's just an interesting little snippet. It said, North Americans avoided becoming addicted to tobacco for thousands of years by surrounding its use with ritual and having strictly observed restrictions on when and how it was taken. While this kind of context is unlikely to develop in the modern Western world, a renewed sense of a social code of acceptable and unacceptable behaviour when taking drugs like alcohol and cocaine would certainly help reduce the harm. Isn't that fascinating? So, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking like, like cowboy films, the Indians there smoking their peace pipes or, or whatever. Because that was so rigidly structured and ritualized, then the idea that you like go away with the with the peace pipe behind a rock and just, you know, get yourself completely stoned, that just wasn't acceptable in the culture. It was very structured. Is it possible to introduce traditions like that into a society? Well, maybe that's a tough call for a government to do, but it would be desirable, wouldn't it, if traditions such as that grew up around, in particular, uh, alcohol. Uh, in the book, he manages, uh, mentions CBD oil, which I've been aware of for quite a while. You get these shops that sell CBD products. CBD is like a cannabis extract. I used to think these shops were basically like getting around the law and sort of selling cannabis. It was a bit of a gray area. That was what it was all about. Uh, but I was wrong about that. CBD is a non-psychoactive product. So it is not a recreational drug, but it has other effects on the body, other relaxing effects that people claim are helpful uh, for various uh, conditions. But anyway, so you learn something every day. CBD is, is not a psychoactive product. Right, what are the harms of cannabis? Now, cannabis is normally at the forefront of the drug legalization uh, campaign 
but I'll just read a passage here. So cannabis scored highest on the drug-related damage and drug-related impairment of mental functioning, mostly because of the harms associated with smoking and the drug's links with depression and psychotic symptoms. Cannabis dependence occurs in about 10% of users, and there is a physical withdrawal syndrome with some unpleasant symptoms such as decreased appetite, weight loss, mood changes, and insomnia. These are real and not just psychosomatic. Drugs like Remonobant, uh, which block the effects of cannabis, can precipitate these withdrawal symptoms. Even without physical symptoms, many regular users experience psychological craving if they stop. We now know that in Western countries, up to 8% of people who use cannabis become dependent on it and seek treatment. About half of these are under 18, which is very worrying. It seems that the rise of stronger versions such as skunk is largely responsible for the rise in dependence, partly because skunk lacks the protective element CBD. So 8% of cannabis users become dependent uh, and seek help. What proportion become dependent and don't seek help? Or are sort of on the edge of dependent, you know, can't, can't really help it, but it's not quite reaching crisis point. I mean, same with alcohol. There's a lot of people with an alcohol problem who don't actually become alcoholics. You wouldn't actually class them as alcoholics, but it is something that's having a real negative impact on their lives. So that's very concerning. Well, it's still on cannabis. Often the biggest effect that cannabis has on people's lives is a general sense of demotivation and a lack of enjoyment of activities when not intoxicated. And if used regularly, especially daily, it can disrupt schoolwork and employment. Um, so long-term use can affect cognitive skills, making it harder to learn and retain information. Now, again, talking about the moral side of drug use, I think to choose to take a drug that's going to tend to lead to you to some degree, maybe becoming some sort of dropout, becoming a non-contributor to society is that a morally acceptable decision does our society say yep yeah, if you want to go down that path it's sort of quite likely to end up being a freeloader to some degree is that okay well i think our society has said no that's not okay and i think there's good reason for that i've known a few people who've used cannabis and then have been in the situation where they just the way i put it sometimes like they can't get their life in gear they can't quite commit and take the initiative uh, and do something and that is uh, a problem and in terms of affecting cognitive skills harder to learn retain information i mean you, you can have a secular version of this argument i'll, I'll present it in the, the christian form is that if you've got god-given capacities and abilities that's for a purpose you're on earth to use those for good ends to fulfill your potential to fulfill a mission of meaningful goals through your life so if you choose to deliberately degrade these capacities given to you, you're going to be less able to fulfill the purpose of your life. That's our Christian point of view. You can mount a similar argument, I'm sure, from a, a secular perspective. So again, cannabis use, is it a moral issue? I would argue it most definitely is. Okay, what's he got to say next is a, a quotation. He said, a terrifying new legal high has hit our streets. Methicarbonol known by the street name Wiz, is a clear liquid that causes cancer, liver problems and brain disease and is more toxic than ecstasy and cocaine. Addiction can occur after just one drink and addicts will go to any lengths to get their next fix, even letting their kids go hungry or beating up their partners to obtain money. Casual users can go into blind rages when they're high. And police have reported a huge increase in crime when the drug has been used. Worst of all, drinks companies are adding Wiz to fizzy drinks and advertising them to kids like they're playing Coca-Cola. Two or three teenagers die from it every week, overdosing on a binge, then another 10 from having accidents caused by reckless driving. Whiz is a public menace. When will the governments think of the children and make this dangerous substance illegal? Now, you've you probably worked out what he's doing there, isn't it? I mean, he's talking about alcohol. He just came with a different name, and he's talking about uh, alcohol. So his point is that if alcohol uh, arrived now, uh, it's very unlikely it would be legalized because of the negative effects. And I think the negative effects, the scale of the negative effects, are due to its uh, legality and social acceptability. Now, I'm not suggesting that alcohol uh, should be made illegal, but a major thesis in this book 
is that making drugs legal doesn't increase the harm, doesn't make more people use them. Whereas the evidence with alcohol is just completely the opposite. It's completely the opposite. It might take a long time for the culture to shift. So these become these things become totally socially acceptable, but that's what you're heading uh, towards. Okay, I did this is another uh, snippet here. I came across, this is talking about uh, cat as a, a drug popular in, uh, in parts of, of Africa. And it says, Yemenis and Ethiopians have taken this habit with them as they've migrated across the world, creating a small global trade. That's interesting, isn't it? That's not a factor you hear about very often with regard to uh, immigration. But it is the case that with immigrants, if you have a, a number from the same place, they will tend to bring elements of their culture with them, including uh, negative aspects like particular uh, recreational uh, drugs. I mean, another one, I've heard it suggested that like um, criminals using guns is something that came to Britain uh, from cultures uh, in other countries where that was uh, was more available. Right, so just still talking about um, drugs, the possibility of addiction, etc. Now, some research has been done with monkeys. I always take it with a pinch of salt, research with animals. But this is interesting in any case. Monkeys have a hierarchy in their society. And it's been found that monkeys towards the bottom of the hierarchy are more susceptible to becoming addicted to uh, like recreational pleasure-enhancing drugs when they're made available to them. So if that's reflected in humans, that will mean that drug addiction, drug problems will be more common among poorer elements of society, lower socioeconomic groups, however you want to put it. So if you're concerned about equality, the very last thing you want should be uh, recreational drugs on the market because they're going to hit hardest the people who are already quite a way down in the hierarchy. Uh, uh, yeah, talking about addiction, addictive personality, etc. This is a snippet about alcohol that I wasn't aware of. It said male children of male alcoholics have alterations in their GABA receptors that make them less sensitive to alcohol so they can consume more than their friends from the first day they start drinking. This makes them drink more and so become dependent more rapidly. So alcoholics' children are at greater risk of alcoholism, not for, well, not just for social reasons, but because of uh, physical reasons as well. Uh, so as the family party, protecting children, promoting the well-being of children is something that we're very concerned about. Um, so reducing heavy alcohol use and alcoholism uh, is uh, very important. Notice that's male children of male uh, alcoholics uh, as well. So, yeah. Now, talking about the, I say, addictive personality, what sort of people tend to end up addicted to drugs? There's various personal characteristics. Um, impulsivity, tendency to act without thinking. Pretty obvious. Um, compulsivity. Obsessive compulsive people are less likely to start taking drugs as they're more anxious about the negative effects, but find it harder to stop once they start because drug taking becomes a compulsive uh, behavior. Okay, anxiety, depression, and stress. It's quite obvious, isn't it? The common sense that people suffering with those conditions are more likely to seek solace in a, a recreational drug or, or well, a, a drug in any case. Um, adolescent use. In other words, if people start using drugs in adolescence, that's a real risk factor that they'll continue using them through their whole life. More so than other stages. You know, if a person dabbles with drugs in their 30s, there's a greater chance that they will then leave that behind than if they dabble in their adolescence, which more often means that they will use drugs throughout their life. Uh, gender, men tend to basically take illegal and, and recreational drugs more than women because men tend to be more... Uh, sensation seeking right protective factors what sort of people are less likely to get addicted to drugs right basically people who are worried about the health consequences of drugs now uh, that's absolutely true but a substantial part of this book uh, Mr Nutt is that you're trying to tell people that various drugs are actually not that harmful they're not that dangerous so therefore, that's going to mean people are more likely to take them 
And when they've taken those ones, they might be more likely to take even more of the same drug, higher doses, or move on to other drugs, uh, which is not what you want at all. So in terms of education, presenting health dangers seems like a very important thing to do. Uh, what else prevents people becoming addicted to drugs? Regular testing. People involved in sports or in the military, say, uh, where there's regular drug testing, they tend not to take drugs because there's a price to pay and the chance of getting caught is very high and the penalty is very significant. So generally people don't do it. So con artificial consequences like that can be powerful deterrents. Uh, bad experiences, some people try drugs and it goes wrong. They just have a bad first experience, but some people persevere through them. And look at smoking. Does anyone enjoy their first cigarette? I mean, by all accounts, no, it's pretty disgusting, but people persevere because of peer pressure or they think it's cool or whatever, uh, and, and they, they, they break through the revulsion and become habitual smokers. Uh, some people just try drugs and don't like the experience. They find it frightening or unsettling or whatever. This is an interesting little snippet. Han Chinese people tend to have a genetic uh, feature that means that they don't enjoy alcohol. Um, it's, they call it the Chinese flushing reaction. So I assume they just tend not to drink alcohol. Uh, people with well-balanced moods are less likely to become drug addicts. And the last one, this is very interesting. Uh, people who pledge abstinence are likely to follow through on it and are much less likely to become drug addicts. So making public declarations of abstinence as part of a religious or social group can create strong social motivations to stay away from drugs. Now, if you talked about you know, suggesting that in schools or whatever, you could imagine the Scottish educational establishment would laugh at it. They'd think that was hilarious. The most ridiculously old fashioned moralistic idea, because obviously children are going to take drugs, aren't they? Young people are going to take drugs. Of course they are. It doesn't matter what they promise or not. Of course they're going to do it. That's what they would say. Uh, but they would be wrong. This is saying pledging absence is important. There's the social element, the fact that you've made that promise in front of other people, then that strengthens your, your, your willpower, your resolve to stick to it. If there's a religious element as well, it's not just before other people, it's, uh, it's before God as well. So that just adds another motivation. So is that something that's worth exploring? Now in America a few years ago, I don't know if it still goes on, there was the silver ring thing uh, where young people wore a ring indicating their pledge to sexual chastity before marriage. And the liberals absolutely hated it. I mean, The Guardian ran article after article about how destructive and dangerous this was. I mean, they're trying to pluck arguments out of, out of thin air. Um, I mean, is there a place for the same thing with drugs? Getting young people to, to make some sort of pledge in some context or another about it? Maybe there is, maybe there is. Uh, just another uh, snippet here relating to, to education. Tony Adams, the England football player, was an alcoholic for uh, many years. And it says, uh, in order to learn to feel pleasure from other activities, he started to educate himself, took up the piano and developed an interest in the arts. Okay, well done him. That seems like a sensible thing to do. That made me think, though, is that not part of what education is about? As you're trying to give people uh, interests things to take pleasure in that are deep and meaningful and positive and just add something to your life. And the, the more experiences, the, the, the more people are, enable, are able to appreciate those sorts of things, then surely the less susceptible they are to temptations to seek pleasure in much, uh, much riskier ways. So now that's an important part of, of education, maybe a neglected aspect of education. Um, inculcating appreciation of good things, wholesome good things. Uh, another snippet here was the actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. I can't say I'd heard of him, but anyway, he died of a, a heroin overdose, but he had a heroin addiction, but then he, he kicked the habit and he was clean for 23 years, didn't touch it for 23 years. Then on one occasion, he relapsed, just took her heroin, and the first time it took him, uh, he took it, uh, he died. And the point the author makes with this is once an addict, always an addict. And he makes that point at several uh, junctures through the book. 
Now that seems like quite a hopeless conclusion, doesn't it? Once an addict, always an addict. What it means by it is, once you've been an addict, even if you're abstaining, the potential of that addiction is lurking below the surface. And if you feed it, it will be back in action very, very quickly. Um, so it's a warning. So don't think that you're cured and you can you, know, you can try a bit of heroin and that will just be, be a one-off. It won't. You, you are a heroin addict. So if you take heroin, then you're straight back into that, uh, that cycle. But, uh, well, maybe sobering is not the word to use. But it, it's, um, it, it makes you think, it just brings home the seriousness of drug addiction, that it's not something that can be overcome permanently in, in any sense. It's always going to be a, a danger to someone throughout the rest of their life. But it's talking a bit more about what's protective against addiction. It says, more generally, being religious is protective against addiction. So religious people are less likely to become drug, drug addicts. Why could that be? He doesn't speculate about that. I'll do some speculating. Uh, one thing would be that they're going to be in a more conservative peer group. So they will not tend to come across as many people who are cool with taking drugs. They'll come across more people who are you know, horrified at the idea of taking uh, illegal drugs. Uh, that's very possibly a part of it. The other part of it uh, would be that, that they will have a moral objection to illegal drug taking. I would say I think about Christians and it would be the same with Muslims as well. It's not just, you know, drug taking is a bit unwise or best wait until you're later. It's just this is wrong. It's something that you ought not to do. So that moral belief is protective against becoming a drug addict. So the more people who internalize that moral belief, the less drug addicts there are going to be. That would seem to be the logical conclusion. Now, Mr. Nutt writes in his book, he would not accept that because he says drug use is not moral. And if you try and make out it is, that's just counterproductive. And yet it seems to me that this uh, moral revulsion at illegal drug use does seem to be protective. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, opiates and crack cocaine are so widely used by prostitutes and why many users become prostitutes is that these drugs remove the disgust of sex with strangers. If an addict stops taking the drugs but doesn't have the option of a different job, this makes life unbearable. Now, I hadn't heard that before. So the idea is that the drug enables the prostitute to overcome the revulsion at the work that they are doing. And that just underlines, doesn't it, that prostitution is not just like another job. It's not just like another job. It is a trap that people uh, find themselves in. They might have walked into it of their own volition, not always, but in some cases they've walked into the trap of their own uh, volition, but still they find themselves caught in it. Our policy of the family party, as it would criminalise the buying and selling of sex, just to avoid people, find themselves in this disastrous situation. And when people are in that situation, they can be you know, forcibly, if necessary, pointed in a more positive direction. In the next section, it talks about some drugs that are used as substitutes for addictive drugs. Drugs Like in, in Scotland, methadone is used for heroin addicts. Now, I used to think that basically methadone was the same thing as heroin. So they just replace it. And the advantage of methadone is they don't have to steal it and they know it's pure and it can be injected safely and whatever, you know, all, all these sort of things. Uh, but it's, there's actually more to it than that. These substitute drugs have characteristics that mean means the drug addiction is less harmful. So, for example, with, with methadone, that this is not like technically detailed, but just to give you the rough idea. Whereas a heroin hit might be a very fast high followed by a very low low and then you've got the withdrawal and you're wanting the next hit whereas with methadone the effect would come on more slowly wouldn't reach quite such a peak but then would last a lot longer so the time between uh, doses if you like could be a uh, could be a lot longer so for someone battling an addiction that that is an easier drug to manage even if they're going to just continue taking it it's more manageable uh, but maybe in the long term, is it easier to, to escape the addiction? I'm not quite sure. But in the shorter term, in day to day, it's much easier to stabilize and to manage, which is uh, a good thing. But still, obviously, people on methadone are a menace to society. I've probably heard me tell this story before. Uh, there was an accident just in the village where I live here when someone on methadone drove a vehicle into a family with a tragic 
consequences. So even though he might have been a bit safer than the effects of a drug addiction, uh, this family out for a walk uh, was obviously not. Now it says here, if addicts don't know where the next hit is coming from, for example, if they don't know, if they don't have the money to buy it, they can become hugely distressed and possibly dangerous. As the beginning of withdrawal setting, concern about the negative consequences of their actions is often overwhelmed by their desperate need to get the drug. The search for money can often lead to acquisitive crime. Stealing from shops or from friends and family, this in turn, turn leads to problems with the police, time in prison and the erosion of the trust and support of those around them. So that's a consequence of drug addiction. So if someone takes a highly addictive drug, they know that what they're doing is taking an increasing risk. The longer they go, the more risk they're taking of finding themselves in that situation and behaving in that way, losing control of their inhibitions and behaving in these criminal and immoral ways. So therefore, choosing to go down that path, choosing to take heroin, choosing to take it again and again and again before addicted, then I believe that they are immoral decisions because of the consequences that can be foreseen. Whereas Mr. Nutt would say, no, 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 like becoming a heroin, heroin addict is just something that happens to you. Um, it's, it's like, you know, it's like catching COVID or something. You just have to sympathize with people that it happens to. Now, it's talking about uh, people who are addicted now. It says if someone stops taking a drug, but then relapses, it says it shouldn't be seen as a moral failure. Right, if that's not a moral failure, how about the person who does stay off the drug? Is it right to them to say, well done, you've done really well there, congratulations, I admire what you've done. Surely that's gonna be the right response. If that's the right response to someone who stays off a drug, what should the response be to someone who lapses? Well, you might not want to articulate it to them in a like, oh, you've really messed up there, haven't you? You, you, know, you weak-willed person. Okay, you might want to say that to them, but actually you don't admire what they've done. It would have been more admirable if they'd stayed off the drug. So then his desire to be non-judgmental ends up incoherent. It, it, it doesn't really, you can't really follow it through to its conclusions. Right, more broadly, it's very important that our current generation of politicians appreciate the dynamics of addiction, of addiction and don't return to the primitive discredited moral model that's going out of fashion in the United States. Now again, uh, Mr. Nutt is an expert on drugs. He's not an expert in uh, morality. And again, he's just so hostile to the concept of morality, which I think tends to be a feature of those of a progressive mindset. They want to demoralize issue after issue, issues where it was previously seen as a moral failing to take a certain course of action or to fail to take a certain course of action. They, they want to say, no, that's not really a moral issue anymore. And that's what he's bringing here. It's like to make a moral judgment is, is immoral. That's more or less what he's saying. At the very least, it's always unhelpful. It's always more helpful to look at things from a non-moral perspective. He said, even if we brought in the death penalty for drug possession, as in Singapore, we would be unlikely to see all drug seeking, seeking cease. Addicts often see their friends and acquaintances injure themselves or die as a result of the habit, and this doesn't stop them from using. So it says in Singapore, even though there's the death penalty for even drug possession, it doesn't eliminate drug use. Well, of course it doesn't eliminate it, but the question is, what is the level of drug abuse in a country like Singapore? And in some Islamic nations as well, there are pretty stinging uh, punishments for uh, illegal drug possession even. What is the level of the drug problem in Singapore? Pretty low. And a lot of these other countries with have very harsh punishments, I would suggest they would be extremely uh, low. So I don't think it makes a strong case there. I'm not saying that we should be, you know, cutting people's hands off for possessing cannabis or something. But I, I think his point, basically, the punishment doesn't work is not supported. Just getting addicts into treatment in the first place is extremely challenging. And many simply won't come if the only outcome permitted is abstinence. How about that then? So drug addict really thinks he's got a problem. Think, right, I'm going to go and see the doctor and talk about my heroin addiction to see if I can help. But my doctor's just trying to help, going to help me to get off heroin. I don't want that. 
so I'm not going to go. Have we really got to have sympathy for that person? Really? Are they not saying, I've got a problem, but I want to live with my problem? I don't want it to change. Or I've got a problem that uh, I've got myself into, but I don't want to solve it. I just want you to foot the bill for it. I'm, I'm not so keen on that line, to be honest. I'm not buying that. If someone wants help, that should be help with a view to leaving behind their drug habit completely. Not not necessarily over the short term, but the longer term, that's going to be the objective. If that's not someone's objective, then I'm not sure it's the job of the state to be investing in them to try and help them. Now, I'm open to discussion on that, but that's my initial uh, response to that. Tell me in the comments below what you think. Right, Portugal. Now, whenever drugs policy talked about, you always hear about Portugal. Portugal, they've decriminalized drugs, they've legalized drugs, anything goes in Portugal, and it's working out really well, which just proves that we should be decriminalizing all drugs as well and have a free-for-all in Britain. That's the way the argument comes. That, that's the Twitter version of the argument. But this book, it explains what the policy is in Portugal, and it is not highly liberal anything goes at all at all. I'll explain to you what it's all about. So it says, in 1999, the Portuguese Parliament approved a new national strategy which came into effect in 2001. Under this new strategy, drugs covered by the UN international conventions remain illegal, but the penalties for personal use are no longer dealt with through the criminal justice system. So the drugs are still illegal. Um, not dealt with through the criminal justice system, but through another means. That would be like you know, parking fines, for example. Anyway, so anyone caught with less than 10 days average supply uh, of a drug, five, kilo, five grams of cannabis, one gram of heroin, has it confiscated by the police and they're given a ticket requiring them to appear before a dissuasion board within 72 hours. The board normally is made up of two psychiatrists and a legal specialist who ask about their drug use, categorise them as a regular user or sorry, recreational user, regular user, or addict, warn them of the risk they're taking, and offer treatment if appropriate. Okay, right, what do you think about that for first offences? Now, first offences in Scotland, what's quite likely to happen is, like, zero. Nothing at all. I mean, you can't walk around Edinburgh for more than about an hour without smelling cannabis somewhere. Uh, and uh, the police just do nothing. So compared to Scotland, I think Portugal's response to like low-level personal drug possession and use, I think it's far tougher uh, than Scotland's. I, I, I think that's my impression in any case. There are a range of potential sanctions in Portugal, from, from a fine to having social security benefits cut or being forced to go to rehab. Does this sound like soft-touch policy? Doesn't to me. In practice, though, about 85% of those sent to the board get a suspension with no sanctions and um, most of the rest are given treatment. Supplying drugs is still penalised. If you're caught with more than 10 days personal supply, you'll have to go to court and could face prison. A good comparison is with traffic offences. Dangerous driving might land you in jail, uh, but failing to wear a seatbelt or cycling through a red light is more likely to result in a fine or having to go on a road safety course. Right, so what do you think of the Portuguese policy there? To be honest, I, I think it sounds quite reasonable. It doesn't sound particularly soft and indulgent. To me, I mean, to, compared to Scotland, it, to be honest, it sounds a bit tougher. So I'm quite open to looking at the Portuguese experience. But just bear in mind to say the way it's presented in debate in Scotland is often extremely misleading. It's as though it's a total free-for-all uh, in Portugal. Everything's legal and it's working out just great. So in Portugal, although there's been a slight increase in drug use among adults, there's been a decrease among 15 to 19-year-olds indicating lower levels of experimentation. Right, okay. Is that because of the change in policy? The increase with adults, decrease with young people? That sounds to me like I need more information to make any sense out of that, really. Uh, this is very positive because this was smaller than a neighboring country, Spain, for example, and drug behavior in teenage years has a strong relationship with drug use in later life. But drug use in older years is increasing. So it's a bit unclear. Portugal did not become a destination for foreign drug users. 95% of those caught since the strategies were introduced have been Portuguese. Of course, it's not going to be a destination for foreign drug users. 
because it's actually quite tough. So if you go for your like cannabis smoking weekend, you could find yourself having to appear before this panel within 72 hours. And then who knows what might happen then. So if you want to go on your cannabis weekend, you better go into Amsterdam. So that's for the reason they're not going to, uh, to Portugal. Far from being soft on drugs, the Portuguese state is intervening more than ever. Uh, I agree. Taking steps to deter people from progressing from recreational use to addiction and heavily encouraging people into treatment. Yeah. I don't, that's, I'm all for it. So Portugal has not gone soft on drugs. It's been pretty tough and proactive, uh, but maybe in different ways, uh, creative ways. But overall, I think what they're doing uh, seems to have a lot of positives. Right, so prevention of addiction. The cheaper and more available something is, the more addiction there will be. Right, that sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? So surely if you can reduce supply, price goes up. So there's going to be less addiction. I think Mr. Nutt probably wouldn't agree with that. Uh, for example, there's been a substantial rise in gambling addictions in the UK since gambling laws were relaxed. Even addicts are price sensitive, though less so than non-addicts. Increasing the cost of cigarettes has caused many smokers to cut down. And although they remain addicted, smoking 10 a day is far less harmful than smoking 20. Before addiction sets in, the price is even more influential at stopping people from taking up drugs in the first place or going on to use them extensively. Taxing legal addictive substances is effective in reducing use and addiction. Now, the argument there could be that you legalize drugs, but then you put such a massive tax on them that they're so expensive that, that no one takes them. But of course, if you do that, what happens? Then the illegal market kicks in again. I think that's what happened in some American states, I understand, where they've legalized cannabis, that there's still a huge... Uh, black market for it because it undercuts it uh, in price. Now, it's pretty obvious to me, if you make something illegal, you are going to increase the price. So therefore, you're going to reduce the amount of addiction. That seems like common sense to me, but Mr. Nutt seems to resist that uh, conclusion. So as I was saying before, there's no such thing as recovery from addiction in the way that you can recover from a broken arm. Abstinence itself could be described as a form of maintenance. Yeah, I can see what he's saying there. That's basically uh, a salutary warning for people who have been addicts that the danger of relapse is uh, very real. But it's also a sad situation and it underlines the danger of uh, drugs. So what he's saying basically, there's only two options here. There's uh, abstinence to avoid the... Because he says if you don't abstain, that the possibility you end up addicted is sort of out of your control potentially. And once you are addicted, that's it. So the only surefire way to avoid addiction is total abstinence, which I think is a pretty positive message I think, to deliver uh, in schools. Now, talking about the controlled addict who, you know, they're, they're kept on an even keel, does that actually do more harm than good in some ways? Obviously, they're still a danger. They still might, you know, burn their flat down and set the whole block of flats on fire, still might crash the car into people, still might steal... Uh, seal things not because they need the money but because they're just out of control there's all those problems the other problem is it gives the message in society hey i'm a drug addict and i'm getting along fine it's under control i'm living my life and it's not too bad that message overall the net effect of it can be very negative it makes other people think oh it's not so dangerous after all maybe i'll give it a try because it looks like even for the people who end up addicted. It's not that bad. So even though with our current medical knowledge, addiction can't be cured, there are still ways to reduce the harm that it causes. There are treatments that can reduce the distress of the illness and make relapse less likely. To start, we must fully adopt the medical model of addiction and discard the long dis discredited moralistic one that blames the addict for their condition. I would say... I wouldn't blame an addict for being an addict, but in the process of becoming an addict, almost all cases, there, there would have been an element of moral responsibility. Okay, uh, That doesn't mean you condemn people. You know, Everyone makes mistakes, everyone does things wrong, but uh, drug addiction, I feel in, the, in almost all cases, is the result of making morally wrong decisions. When someone develops type two diabetes, they may have been getting the disease 
Uh, they may have made getting the disease more likely through their diet, but that doesn't mean we would deny them insulin. Quite apart from the fact that many of the factors that put them at risk, such as their genes, are out of their control, there's also a humane recognition that even a self-induced illness should receive treatment. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, d does anyone disagree with that, though? Is there anyone who's saying choosing to take drugs is, uh, is immoral, but so we shouldn't treat drug addicts, we should leave them to die in the gutter? No one's saying that. No one's saying that. So it's making it sound like in order to be a compassionate person who wants to help drug addicts, you have to believe that taking illegal recreational drugs is not immoral. Doesn't follow. Doesn't follow. So Mr. Nutt is an expert in drugs, but he is not an expert in uh, moral thinking. I'm not suggesting that anyone is. Uh, by the way, I mean, the people in universities are often the professionals in moral thinking. You should see what they come up with. It's all over the place. Right, cocaine. There's a little snippet here. Um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth endorsed Mariani wine. He was pictured on uh, advertising posters for it. It was a type of wine that contained cocaine. So that was an interesting little uh, historical snippet. Right, so cocaine. It says, cocaine powder is expensive compared with other party drugs, such as ecstasy and amphetamines. Uh, so it's seen as a status symbol, basically. Um, and it says, what does it do to people? It makes them more aggressive, self-interested, risk-taking, and they don't care so much about the consequences for other people. And it suggests that this might have played a part in causing financial disasters. Now, for example, the credit crunch, which is a major worldwide economic shock, and the suggestion has been made here that that might in part have been the result of decision makers being under the influence of cocaine. Now, if that's true, that's a very, very serious issue, isn't it? That this irresponsibility, drug-induced irresponsibility on behalf of a relatively small number of people had a very deleterious effect on the worldwide economy. So... Yeah, that's an issue that maybe financial institutions need to look at uh, very carefully. <clears throat> the thing you're saying about this, is, so cocaine is known to make people aggressive and heartless. Basically, they don't care about the results on other people. Now, if you choose to take a drug that makes you a bit aggressive, selfish and uh, uncaring of the consequences for other people, surely taking that drug is immoral, isn't it? It has to be. It's like if you had a drug that you knew, you take the drug and 99% of the time when you take the drug, within three hours you will have gone out and tried to kill someone. Should it be legal to take that drug? Well, no, of course it shouldn't because taking that drug is virtually as bad as actually murdering someone. So if someone said, no, I've got freedom of choice to put in my body what I want. If I want to take that drug, it's up to me. Then when I murdered the person, well, diminished responsibility, I couldn't help it. I was under the influence of a drug, so it wasn't my fault. Does that wash? Well, a lot of people seem to think it does, but I say it most definitely does not. You've made the wrong decision by taking the drug. When the results of that drug come home to roost, they are your responsibility because you took the, the moral decision to take it. Right, so with regard to cocaine, Mr. Nutt offers some suggestions. He suggests that maybe we could make some sort of sanitized versions of it and that would reduce the harm. So he said we could maybe make a weak sort of cocaine drink or cocaine tea uh, that could be a less harmful alternative to cocaine powder or crack. Now, right, what do you think about that idea? Cocaine tea. Buy it from the shop, I assume. It's like a very mild version of cocaine. What would happen? Well, it would vastly in increase the number of people taking cocaine. What would young people do? They'd get the whole teapot full and put, you know, 30 tea bags in and gulp the whole lot down to try and get a decent dose of it. They'd take more and more and more. And the people who would find, you know, the tea is great, they really like it, but surely the real thing's even better. They will then be very likely to go on to try uh, genuine cocaine. So the idea of cocaine tea, I think it's, well, it doesn't seem a good idea to me. Let's put it that way. I think it's thinking, again, it's too short term. And it's too focused on the individual. If you've got someone who's a cocaine addict and they can persuaded, be persuaded to swap to cocaine tea, then that potentially could be helpful for that person. But impact on wider society in the longer term, then I would imagine it would not 
uh, be good. All right, what have we got next? Uh, just a snippet here, an estimate. In the 21st century, it's estimated that a billion people will die from smoking-related diseases, half of them in China. Generally, people die of uh, smoking-related causes in Scotland. Last time I looked, it was uh, 9,000 and something. 9,000 a year dying of smoking. Now, we've got a table in the book here. It compares the health damage done by smoking with that done by cocaine. And obviously, the damage done by smoking is far, far higher. It's in a completely different league. And his point is, you see... Well, it doesn't quite say it, but it's as though he's saying, you see, cocaine isn't that bad. It's tobacco that's the real problem. Now, within society as a whole, you, you could say that. Why is tobacco the real problem? Because it's legal, so, so many people do it. That's the reason. The reason the harms of cocaine are relatively low is because it's illegal and it's kept at the fringe of society to some degree. But he doesn't see that conclusion. He, he fails to see that. The other thing he says with, with tobacco is he emphasises that people say smoking tobacco makes them feel relaxed or happy or whatever. He said, but almost all of that effect is just relieving withdrawal symptoms. So you have one cigarette, makes you feel okay, it fades away, you start feeling bad because you're getting withdrawal symptoms, they're relatively mild, but it's withdrawal symptoms. Then your next cigarette makes you feel better, but all it's done has got you back to, to level zero. So you're spending your money just to go to level zero, just be normal. Then it gets worse, then you get back up to normal, it gets worse, get back up to normal. And obviously that's an unfortunate cycle uh, to be in. Uh, vaping, people who are addicted to nicotine through vaping, they've basically got the same problem. They're spending their money to damage their, I don't know if you say mental health, but to negatively affect their mood so that they have to spend money to, to just maintain equilibrium. Well, this next section is sobering, about uh, smoking still. Now, I had a friend in Scotland, I haven't seen him for a long time, but he, he was a surgeon. And what he did basically was he cut people's legs off. We, we do a couple of uh, legs a week. And he never had a customer who wasn't a, sm a smoker. So the problem was caused by circulatory problems related to smoking. So when I was teaching, I, I would do you know, PSE lessons, talk about smoking. It'd be one of the stories I would always tell the boys. I'd say about my friend who cuts people's legs off, he's, ne he's never had a customer who wasn't a smoker. I think it's quite a powerful story to tell. But this is interesting as well. He said, in my clinical work, I've come across people who've had to have both legs amputated after developing peripheral arterial disease from smoking. This is a terrifying example of the power of addiction because unlike having lung cancer, they would have got better if they'd stopped. Not being able to quit, even after you've lost a leg, and continuing to smoke until your second leg has to be removed shows just how powerful the drive to smoke can be. Right, that would be in the lesson plan for every school in Scotland if I uh, had my way. Now, when it comes to smoking, governments have taken a harm reduction approach. They haven't just said, right, it's illegal, but they've tried to do things to restrict it, to make people more aware of the dangers of it, to basically turn society against it to reduce its social acceptability. And those have been successful. And I think that's been the right approach and it will continue uh, into the future. Uh, why don't I take the same approach to other drugs? Because with, uh, with tobacco, we're in a different situation. You've got to start from where you're at. Uh, that there's very widespread addiction to the drug. Basically, the horse has bolted. It's already very prevalent in society, very high level of uh, addiction. So if you have a law that's too far out of sync with culture and practice in the nation, then that's going to be pretty tough. Now, there may be some situations where the issue is so grave that you have to say, look, I don't care how tough this is. I don't care how dislocated from public opinion or current practice this is. This is so grave, it's just got to stop right away. But I think with smoking, uh, it's not that sort of case. So the law, it can lead public opinion, but it can't be too far out of step. Uh, with the culture. Now, some people might argue with cannabis. Well, you know, the horse is bolted with that. It's so widespread that, you know, we've just got to accommodate it now. And as soon as that had happened, then the next drug along, we'd be having the same argument and they, they would fall like dominoes. So I'd be very keen that we don't start that domino collapse going by legalizing cannabis. I think we need to hold the line where we are. Now, with cannabis, it is the case that use is very widespread and that's very concerning. 
but I still think we should be trying to rein that back while it's illegal rather than opening the floodgates by making it uh, legal. Uh, just a snippet here, I guess, about uh, vaping. Vaping is available on the NHS in Wales, by the way. I assume they think if people were previously smokers, they can get it. Problem then is you get someone who hasn't previously smoked, and they say, so you, you've got to say, you know, two 17-year-olds, one of them used to smoke, so they get vaping on the NHS. The other one made the right choice and never smoked, but they have to pay for their own vaping gear. They're surely going to say it's not fair. I've got a right to vaping gear as well. So what happens in Wales in that case? I don't know. So I'm not sure if that's a sensible way to go down. In terms of vaping, there isn't a huge amount of evidence pointing to problems with vaping. There are some. I mean, breathing in uh, vapes is not as healthy as breathing in fresh air, obviously. Um, but there are not huge health dangers that are coming through. Maybe more will become apparent in the uh, future. Uh, we shall see. What's tending to happen, though, is that, for example, China, the huge cigarette producing country, doesn't want vaping to be seen as particularly safe. So they want it to be to be seen as something a bit dangerous, undesirable, maybe even illegal, restricted, whatever. So China's pressure on the World Health Organization is to be really negative about vaping, whereas some other countries are saying, well, you know, we'd rather people didn't, but it's much better than, uh, than smoking. So again, it's an example where vested interests influence the World Health Organization. My personal view, would we want a culture where more and more people are vaping? No, I, I would not be at all surprised if negative consequences become apparent in the years to come. But vaping has become a lot more prevalent among young people. It's not people who used to smoke who are going to vaping as a better alternative. They're starting vaping because it's safer than smoking. So this is an example where you have a harm reduction philosophy. In other words, you present an option Instead of smoking, here's a safer option, but the result is more people do it. And when more people do it, and more people do it more, how is it going to develop? And also, what else are people going to stop putting in the e-cigarettes? And also, what consequences are going to be found in the future? And also, now is now, is it resulting in more people becoming nicotine addicts? Which, okay, physical health-wise, there don't seem to be huge effects that we're aware of yet. But in terms of just like wasting your money and living the life of an addict unnecessarily, that's not a positive thing. Obviously, so it's not clear cut that the harm reduction policy is actually going to reduce harm overall in the long term. Right, next next the book, it talks about prescription drugs, particularly antidepressants. Um, there's one effect he talks about here that I hadn't heard of before. It's called the energization effect. And this is when you have someone who's really, really depressed. They're just sitting at home, staring at the wall, can't bring themselves to do anything um, in the depths of despair. And then you can perk them up a bit, maybe with an antidepressant, maybe by some other means, and they just cheer up a bit. And they're able to get a bit of motivation, uh, a bit of initiative back. And sometimes it's at that point when they go and commit suicide. They'd wanted to before, but they couldn't quite get themselves to do it. But when they just perk up a bit, they can then go and commit suicide. So that's a danger people have to bear in mind when dealing with extremely depressed people. I'd never heard of that effect uh, before. Uh, right, it talks about painkillers as well in the UK. That There's a fear that um, strong painkillers could end up in the wrong hands and be used as, as recreational drugs, basically. Uh, so doctors can be, in some cases, reluctant to prescribe them because they fear They'll end up in the wrong hands and will fuel uh, drug addiction, which is a you know, perfectly valid fear. But that results in some patients not receiving the best possible uh, pain relief because of this fear. So the people with, uh, with intense pain sort of pay the price be for the culture of drug abuse that exists in our society, which is uh, another negative side product of it. Right, the mental health epidemic. Mental health is the biggest health burden in Europe today, costing more than heart disease, diabetes and cancer combined. Now, if I'd have read that on Twitter, I would have thought, nah, that's not true. But I assume Mr. Nutt has done his research. But mental health costing more than heart disease, diabetes and cancer combined. Leading problem for men is alcoholism, 
leading problem for women is depression. There's an urgent need for better treatments and better drugs. That may be, and there's also an even more urgent need for prevention, because a lot of mental health problems have their roots in family dysfunction, family breakdown in particular. So the Scottish Family Party's policies which would minimise family breakdown would contribute to alleviating the mental health epidemic. But that's, that's like totally out of the field of debate in politics, pretty well everywhere as far as I'm aware, but certainly in Britain and very definitely uh, in Scotland. It says about a quarter of male alcoholics were thought to have an undiagnosed anxiety disorder, which could probably have been treated successfully by SSRIs or if it had been identified before they started drinking heavily. Now that's a good point, isn't it? That people have some sort of what could be described as a mental health condition. I know that term is used very broadly these days, but some, they're facing some sort of personal challenge, mental health problem and start using drugs as a way to cope with it. Whereas if they went to the doctor, then the doctor might have been able to prescribe something or have some other sort of treatment that might have helped. Now, there are controversies in terms of antidepressants, etc. Are they over uh, prescribed? Are their side effects quite significant? Are there various philosophical problems uh, as well? So there's all those downsides to it that we need to consider. But on the other hand, I don't think anyone would suggest you're better off staying at home and becoming an alcoholic than you are seeing the doctor and just taking the doctor's advice and taking some antidepressants or whatever. So that could be a very uh, important message in society. He's also talking about consent for various sort of drugs as well that can help with these conditions. And the point he makes is that the standards for a drug being approved are basically the same as too high. So he said, some types of surgery, one in seven elderly patients will die after the surgery and yet that's acceptable um, you know informed consent the patient says yeah i'll risk it uh, in hope of a, of a good outcome that's fine if someone if a drug company produced a drug that had similarly uh, risky outcomes it would never get approved so people are denied the opportunity to choose drugs that might have a massive benefit for them but also there's a significant risk of of harm and it suggests that there's an inconsistency there and it seems from what he's saying that that is the uh, case right there's a chapter on using drugs to enhance uh, performance that's very interesting and that's developing quite quickly there are drugs now that will enhance pretty well any aspect of human uh, functioning including uh, cognitive function stamina strength etc so there are drugs that people could take before an exam that would just give them a little bit of a, an IQ boost. Should that be allowed? I would suggest uh, not. With all these drugs, there'll tend to be uh, side effects. There'll be problems associated with them. People will start taking uh, too many of them. If it's a really tough exam, oh, it says you're supposed to take one or I'll take three and see what happens. So, you know, there's going to be problems. So another problem is, is it's going to be, uh, it's going to widen inequality in society because the people who can afford them are going to be, tend to be the people who are most able in the first place. So there's some difficult questions to address in the future there. But he's talking about um, psychedelic drugs here in particular. Uh, so psychedelic drugs, just to make sure you are sort of understanding properly, psychedelic drugs are ones that like, induce hallucinations in the mind. So the pleasure is not through changing your perception or your personality with regard to the real world it, it creates like a fantasy world of, of delusions hallucinations whatever you want to call it uh, that in some cases can be pleasurable but the way he's writing here it makes it sound like these psychedelic drugs can be the route to moral progress so saying that back in the 60s which according to progressives that's when moral progress started everything was it was dark before then so he's saying that previously people had like unenlightened views, but then people took hallucinogenic drugs and that helped to open up to the possibility of changing society for the better. Now, I've got, I've got a major problem with that because obviously the prescription should be, well, if you want to make society even better still, then take even more drugs. Is that what he's suggesting? Even if taking the drugs does lead people to positive conclusions, does lead to positive change, that's a very inadequate basis. Surely our decision-making has got to be based on, 
on you know, logic, evidence, reason, not on, oh, I took, a, I took a drug and it's the way it made me feel, or it's the way it made me think. So I think it's a very dangerous line of argument there that he is dabbling with, and I would reject that uh, entirely. He also suggests as well that some people, you know, psychedelic drugs can be used to treat depression. There's evidence that it can be helpful in some ways. Uh, right, I'm not quite sure about that. Potentially that could be okay. But one of the things he said it helps with, for example, is when patients are facing death, it can help them to come to terms with their own mortality because they have this, like it might seem like some sort of out of body experience and people can feel reassured that there's an element of them that's going to live on after death. Right, what do I think about that? I mean, my problem with it is like helping people to base their beliefs on a fantasy, on a hallucination, on a delusion. And I'm not sure that's really ethical because it's got no foundation in reality. So it talks about you know, to help people, uh, dying people, to be reconciled with their imminent death. But reconciled in what way? Just by being having their brain addled a bit so they have some weird experiences. That's not my idea of being reconciled to the prospect of your own death. Um, so, yeah, I'm not with that at all. Now, he's talking here, he talks about the war on drugs, which, he, which is always a pejorative term, isn't it? The idea is that we've tried to criminalise drugs and look, it hasn't worked, it hasn't got us anywhere. He says, rising prices may reduce harm as users consume less per dose, but increase the risks from adulterants that can result from an increase in overdoses when the purity goes up again. So say make drugs illegal and they will be more expensive. So people will use less of them, but the risk of impurities makes them more dangerous. Now, what I would say there, the risk from impurities, who suffers, who is endangered by those risks? I would say the drug user, who is endangered by the risks of more widespread drug addiction, well, the whole of society. So where we've got to weigh up risks, I would tend to say risks that fall on the individual drug user um, way more lightly than risks that fall on the innocent bystanders, neighbours, family, the rest of society. Now, that might be quite a controversial thing to say. I'm not quite sure how to perform the calculus to come to conclusions uh, in that regard. But I think that is a valid principle. Unless no one can persuade me otherwise, I think that is a valid principle to consider in drug policy. A little snippet of information here, quite shocking. This is about UK prisons. UK prisons. 20% of prisoners are addicted to opiates. 20%. 7% try heroin for the first time uh, in jail. I just think that's got to be dealt with. Whatever it takes, that's got to stop. I don't know what it would take, but whatever it takes you you just got to stop that happening. It, it's just appalling on so many fronts from the point of view of justice, from the point of view of the well-being and rehabilitation of prisoners. It's just ridiculous that that's happening and it's got to be, uh, it's, it's got to be stopped. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, interrupting drug supply by taking out drug cartels, he suggested if you take one out, all that happens is that other ones fill in and take the same space. That could be true. You could apply that to lots of other crimes as well, though. So I would think overall still, if you take out one drug cartel, you're increasing the costs of production. You're increasing the risk. You're, in <clears throat> you're increasing the cost. So overall, it is going to inhibit supply. Drug users commit a very high proportion of acquisitive crime. In the UK, it's been estimated that 85% of shoplifting and 80% of domestic burglary is committed by problem drug users, which is unsurprising considering that a her heavy heroin habit costs £300 a week and a bad crack addiction can cost more than £500 a week. There are more than 413,000 problem drug users in the UK, but surprisingly, it's a hardcore of 30,000 who commit more than half of drug-related crime, costing the country £11 billion a year, 11 billion pounds a year. Uh, the budget of the Scottish government is about 40 billion a year, just to put that in perspective. The budget of Police Scotland is about a billion pounds a year. Um, so I guess the total policing budget for the whole of Britain would be around 11 billion, uh, I would guess. So that's the, the drug cost of drug use. 
or £360,000 each. Providing methadone or heroin prescription for these people would cost a fraction of the £360,000, but many users are afraid to begin treatment programmes because of the possibility that once the authorities know they use drugs, they'll be targeted and imprisoned. All right, I find that hard to believe. So do heroin addicts think I'm scared to go to the doctor and ask for help because I'll end up in a cell, prosecuted? Does that happen? I really don't think it does. I mean, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would be amazed if that happens. So I'm not sure you're presenting a fair case there at all. He suggests that if drugs are illegal, then people need the money to buy their drugs so therefore an easy way to make money is by becoming a dealer so you become a dealer then you need to encourage other people to become addicts and it becomes like a pyramid scheme where you've got an increasing number of people motivated to get more and more people hooked on drugs and the argument is that if you legalize drugs if they're dispensed at the chemist or whatever then you don't have this problem uh, which is fair enough I and mean, that's a fair point i don't think it overwhelms all the other points against legalization but at that point uh, as it is does stand. And it says here, unfortunately, uh, the message perceived by many millions of people around the world is that alcohol and tobacco are acceptable and we pay the price for that uh, belief. In other words, the harms done by alcohol and tobacco are a totally different league than the harms done by what are actually chemically more dangerous drugs. And he says that that's really unfortunate. But why do people think that they're acceptable? They think they're acceptable because they're legal. Is that not obvious? So the more drugs you make legal, the more drugs people will think of as being acceptable. So the use will increase in the longer term. You can't do this with a little experiment over like two years or something or two months. You, this is like a generation to generation process. And it's in, only in the longer term that the full consequences will become apparent. Okay, this interesting section. He talks about alternative ways of dispensing drugs. So if drugs were legalized, in some way how could people get them we obviously don't want you know just people on the street selling them to anyone so what are the alternatives one alternative would be to make drugs available on prescription so you go to your doctor so if a young person thinks to themselves i oh, fancy trying a bit of cannabis you'd make an appointment to go and see your gp and say can you prescribe some cannabis please and i assume the gp would say Oh, you know, you need to be aware there's this danger in this danger. But yeah, if you want to, here you are. Go, go ahead, go and get it from the chemist. I mean, w would doctors do that? Do they still take the Hippocratic Oath? Do no harm? I understand they don't actually take that anymore. Would doctors be happy to do that? I hope not. All right, another plan is sell them from pharmacies. I even suggest you could have a specialist, like a new profession, being a drug dispenser. So people come in, you go and see the drug dispenser and say, you know, Basically, what do you recommend I try next? I'm thinking of trying a bit of heroin. And they might say, ooh, heroin, oh, well, it's quite dangerous. Have you thought about trying this one instead? Um, oh, yeah, go on then. Okay, here, here it is. Here are the instructions. Uh, come back next week. Let me know how you're getting on. And we'll, you know, that's what they're suggesting. Problem with selling with pharmacies is pharmacies are very strongly associated with uh, medicine. It's the place you go to get things that are good for you and make you healthier. So dispensing recreational drugs from the same place uh quite uh difficult i think to make sense of that some sort of license sales that's a bit like alcohol and tobacco now i suppose they can only be sold by certain shops in certain conditions certain times of the day uh licensed premises for consumption on site so you would go be a sort of lock-in type thing you go and use the drugs on the premises you're searched on the way out or membership based licensed premises so you member of the club you go to it consume the the drugs within it so the extra advantage there is that other people are not going to stumble into it or observe what's uh going on now looking at those um, some of those you could say would ameliorate some of the worst effects of legalization i don't think they I mean legalization would be a good thing but it does show that there are options other than just the like totally free market approach drugs on the supermarket shelf being advertised on the tv and, and whatever Okay, next chapter is about um, novel psychoactive substances. This was in the news quite a bit, maybe 10 years ago. Um, so new drugs are always being invented all the time and they will hit the streets or be sold in shops and 
they won't be illegal yet because the government hasn't got around to recognizing them, classifying them and declaring them uh, illegal. Um, so what the government's done now is it's basically made a law that's saying any, this is the UK government, any psychoactive substance is automatically illegal until we say otherwise, which seems a pretty sensible thing to me. I mean, one of these new psychoactive substances uh, were uh, poppers. Um, so it says these products were used for sexual purposes. In recent years, poppers have become popular in the male gay scene because they enhance blood flow to the penis. They're used to help people get bigger and firmer erections. They also relax sphincter muscles, so often taken as a prelude to anal intercourse. I suspect the desire of the Puritans to ban them was largely for this latter uh, reason. Uh, in a remarkable act of openness, several homosexual members of the Conservative Party opposed their own government's plan to ban poppers because they used them. They argued banning poppers would increase harms from transmission of bloodborne viruses because anal sex would be more traumatic. The government needed a way out of this impasse. So basically what they did was the Drugs Advisory Agency gave some false advice which enabled the government to reclassify poppers as a non-psychoactive drug, even though it, it really is. But that's a... Anyway, that's, that's the Conservative Party for you. It talks a bit about genetic sequencing. I don't know if you're aware, but the technology with regard to this is advancing very quickly. And we're heading to the stage where we'll be able to look at someone's genes and look at, therefore, their propensity to engage in certain types of behavior. Uh, we'll give an idea of their likely abilities, uh, their personality traits, their susceptibility to various illnesses and to, to drug addictions, possibly, uh, as well. So, so we may end up with people claiming diminished responsibility for their actions because of their genetic code or finding themselves uninsurable because they're considered too great a risk of accidents or uh, disease. Yeah, so you're going to get that. So someone will be up in court and say, right, you, you attack this person and they'll say, oh yeah, but I've got the gene for that. It's just what people with that gene do. Now, I think that's completely wrong, but the trend in society is already towards it's not really your fault. Something caused you to do it. It was out of your control. So there'll be questions to ask, philosophical questions to discuss with regard to this. In terms of insurance, surely that would be uh, a negative development if you had to do a genetic test to get insurance. And some people just couldn't get insurance, health insurance. I mean, I know in the UK, health insurance is not such a big deal, but there are elements where, where it is important uh, as well. Yeah, so some people are more susceptible to certain drugs. It does say here, though, it says addiction is a learned behavior that requires voluntary repetition in order to become habitual. So it's suggesting that in almost all cases, you choose to take a drug, then you choose to take it again, choose to take it again, choose to take it again. And then eventually it gets to the stage where it's not your choice anymore. You're addicted and your your ability to exercise your will has has dissipated and you are an addict but those early stages it is a matter of choice right and i believe that those early choices are moral decisions therefore the outcome from them the addiction is a result of immoral decisions in almost all cases almost all uh, cases so again talking about this uh, you know people are particularly susceptible to a drug it said in theory it should be possible to actively vaccinate someone against a drug for example, cocaine, so that when a person takes it, the immune system is turned on to mop up the cocaine in the blood. That's interesting, isn't it? I think there are already drugs available that do this. I think in some cases, you might get an implant in your arm that means that a certain drug won't work on you. So if someone's been, say, a cocaine addict, uh, they've kicked the habit, uh, they've been clean for a while, and they're offered a vaccination that means their body is not going to respond to cocaine in the way uh, that it used to. Is that a positive thing for that person to choose to do? Uh, very possibly. How about a person who is aware that they're very susceptible to it? Let's say, you know, their genes are saying that they're very likely to become an alcoholic. So they get some sort of vaccination uh, against uh, alcohol. Would that be a good move? Well, that's uh, up for discussion as far as I'm concerned. Let's say you've got a time where there's a rampant problem with a particular drug, very widespread addiction, and that children or young people, let's say you've got 16-year-olds, would you offer them a vaccination against the drug that's blighting that town? If they wanted to take it, would that be a good thing? Or should we say no, that they need to 
just have some strength of character and just say no to it. Uh, but on the other hand, is it if choosing to take a drug is choosing to have the consequences? Similarly, if choosing to uh, like inoculate yourself, well, you know, vaccinate yourself against the drug, is that not therefore a morally right decision to avoid to remove the temptation from yourself? Very possibly open to discuss those things more. But I think in the future, these are going to become really live issues to discuss. I mean, similarly, there are treatments now that help people to uh, give up smoking. There's people who go alcoholism. So I think drugs are going to play a bigger and bigger part in the managing of drugs uh, as well. But no matter how helpful they are, obviously, the ideal is going to be just don't get into that system, that cycle at all. Now, the author's talking about something interesting. He says, I've done some research on replacing ethanol in alcoholic drinks with a safer alternative called Alcarel. So the name's supposed to be like Candorel, you know, the sugar alternative. So the idea is that Alcarel is planned to give the pleasure of alcohol with much less of the harms. Could that be a good thing? So the drinks you could buy in a pub instead of having conventional alcohol would have their substitute in. It might taste the same. It might have the same uh, effect in terms of you know, mood psychologically, but it wouldn't have some of the negative effects. Maybe you know, it wouldn't affect your liver in the same way. It wouldn't give you a hangover. Maybe it wouldn't be as long lasting. So would that be a good thing if you introduce this alcohol alternative? Now to miss the nut, it's obviously is the right thing to do because it reduces harm. So for the person who is going to drink, a certain amount if they drink this alternative it will be less harmful so as far as he's concerned that's it case closed but i think not so simple so if people think alcohol alcohol substitute is safer are they going to drink more of it well, probably they will so the fact that alcohol is bad for your liver does that deter some people from drinking surely it must do so if, if the message is hey this is great it doesn't affect your liver anymore Surely some people think, oh, I can go out and binge three times a week instead of twice a week then uh, instead. It's like if your form of alcohol, let's say the effects of the alcohol wore off in three hours. OK, would that be a good thing? That would mean people don't go and crash the car on the way to work the next morning. That's good, isn't it? But would it mean people are going to drink more because they're not worried about what's going to happen in the morning? So overall, people might drink more and it might have more negative effects. So I think this is a bit more complicated than Mr. Nutt is uh, conceding. But there's also the suggestion as well that you could put something in alcoholic drinks that uh, counteracts some of the negative effects of alcohol. So it's actually there in the drink, so it's not available without it. Could that possibly uh, be a good move? Possibly. Possibly. Again, it might result in people uh, drinking more or it might produce a black market if people think it spoils the alcohol in some sense. So very happy to explore these things, but I think it's uh, quite a complex area to enter into. But he says here, pol drug policy is still based on moral views rather than on the evidence. Now, does he not see that that doesn't make sense? Morality is not something that just emerges from evidence. It doesn't present itself like by magic. It doesn't just sort of uh, emit from the evidence. It's something we have to use our conscience, our moral intuition or the moral principles to bring to bear on it. So I think what he's saying there just illustrates that he doesn't really understand what moral reason, reasoning even is. OK, we're on to the last chapter now. Uh, almost there. So the chapter is called What Should I Tell My Kids About Drugs? So I'll read the first thing. It basically says, uh, young people often appear to think they're immortal. So it says, T telling young people that there's a risk they'll die of young cancer, lung cancer in 30 years' time, that doesn't really have much of an impact. I'm not sure if I believe that. But anyway, he claims that that's, that's what the evidence indicates. But he said, but tell them it'll give them like bad teeth and impotence, then that will, uh, that will really have an effect. Well, maybe it will. Okay, fair enough. Uh, it says, young people are risk takers. Uh, adolescents are more likely than older people to do risky things when they're under the influence and can put parents in a difficult position. As much as they want to discourage them from harmful activities, we also don't want them to try out, try them out secretly or on the streets where they're much more likely to get into trouble. So in other words, it's saying to parents to potentially say to the kids, look, if you're thinking about trying cannabis, 
do it at home in your bedroom or any other drugs as well. Do it in your bedroom and then we're here, we can phone an ambulance if necessary and we can just see how it goes. Okay, now again, he's thinking for a particular young person who has decided they're going to experiment with a particular drug, it would be safer if they did it at home, uh, which is true. And that's as far as his reasoning goes. But on the other hand, what he doesn't take into effect is if you've got all parents in the whole of the land delivering that message to their children, then effectively that's going to uninhibit the children. In other words, our, our parents are fine with us taking drugs. It's no big deal. So I, I'm going to give it a go. Okay. Um, and, and how out of order is it? If your parents say it's fine to do it in your own bedroom, how strongly can they condemn giving it a try somewhere else? Giving it a try somewhere else. That's a pretty minor infringement, isn't it? I mean, what you're doing is okay. You're just doing it in not quite the same place. So the cultural change that would be produced by parents taking that line would be very dramatic. He talks about the importance of culture and lack, uh, a culture that rejects recreational drug use. And yet a lot of the things he recommends would encourage a culture that accepts recreational drug use. So I think his thinking is too short term. It's too individualistic. But that's often the way, isn't it? Often I think with... Um, a sort of more liberal mindset it's focused on the individual and the short term whereas a more conservative view focuses more on wider society in the longer term it says for young people the first time they try a drug is particularly risky because it has a bigger effect uh, the first time and also the habits laid down in adolescence are very powerful throughout the rest of uh, life the evidence indicates Right, some of the it suggests lots of things to say to uh, say to children, but just a couple more to think about. If you get into trouble with drugs, get help quickly. That's a pretty obvious, uncontroversial one, isn't it? Um, but to finish there, I mean, just to conclude, that's that's the end of the points I've, I've highlighted in his book. A big part of what he's saying is drug abuse uh, use is not a moral issue. I disagree with him. It doesn't make any case why it wouldn't be moral. The more evidence he presents, the more it seems to me that it clearly is uh, a moral issue. His response to it is too narrow. It's individualistic and short term instead of broader and uh, longer term. So has he persuaded me of the case for decriminalization of drugs? No, uh, not at all. Looking at the approach of Portugal, you know, are there things to learn from that? I think yes, because there's not a soft approach on drugs. It's a very proactive approach compared to the sort of laissez-faire, do-nothing approach that seems uh, to prevail in Edinburgh, I think it seems an excellent way forward. So we could look at uh, some of the things there. I mean, overall, I still need to find out more about it. I've got another couple of books about drugs to have a look at. But hopefully you found that interesting. I found some of those little snippets in there, in particular, very enlightening. So thanks for watching through to the end, and I'll be back with another book before too long. Okay, bye for now.